Hello everyone and welcome to another Fix It video with me Chaz Large and uh, today on the bench we have uh, this uh, beastie which is a Technics uh, twin cassette deck if I pop it up like that a good old piece of retro hardware cassette decks and the customer says that they've got a problem with one of the decks and uh, silly me I didn't write it down what he said but we will find out and uh, we'll give it an overall uh, service anyway and make sure we can get this uh, back to full working condition for him because he still likes to listen to cassettes and why not uh, some of the best quality music is on cassettes I've got a few myself anyway um, and some of the old uh, 1970s uh, and no on Radio 1 it's uh, whatever <laughs> the old top top of the pops charts uh, that's what we had so uh, let's have a little look at this cassette deck uh, mechanism and uh, see what we've got on here um, and we've got uh, two cassette decks deck one deck two it's made by Technics it's an RS TR575 um, we've got uh, some fancy high-speed fast forward and rewind well Dolby BC noise reduction HX Pro um and uh what else we've we got we've got dubbing facility record level uh atc can't remember what that was automatic time control Pfft, don't know um automatic no not automatic take counter can't be something as simple as that uh power on and off and it's a, just a touch button so that means uh it's going to be like in standby mode so consuming electricity uh all the time it's not in operation on the back we've got simply uh, line in and line out that's all we've got and power so we will plug the power in and just so happens we have a power cable um, that was using for another job standard figure of eight pop that in and we have a standby light on turn it on ka -dunk, ka -dunk, ka -dunk. So we have no operation on. Oh yeah, well it's, it's certainly changing direction on that one. Let's try that one. Oh, we've got a cassette in that one, and it's playing back. So we better see if we can have any playback sound from that. Now, um, many years ago, I bought this little um, battery speaker thing. For Thirteen quid. I got it. Uh, off of eBay because I got some um, uh, nectar points and I thought oh, I might as well spend them on something and this is a handy little uh, twin speaker uh, device it's actually got two speakers on the side and you could plug in a, a USB or a, a micro uh, SD card and it would uh, allow you to uh, play back sound through it um, hasn't got Bluetooth that's the one thing it didn't have uh, but it was quite useful because it had a, light, a nice little clip assembly which you could uh, clip it on top of a laptop um, so you had a de you know, fairly decent sound better than most laptop speakers and then the next thing we need is a phono to jack connector cable always useful when you're doing audio repairs to have a whole bunch of cables uh, where we record playback out is that one that into the line input switch it on press play yeah. Beach Boys press stop take two oh. yeah we go so that one opens oh nice electro driven so what do we got now that's what i call music volume 10 various artists so that's okay and i think we discovered the fault that customer remind me so he can't use deck one it ain't opening so i think uh let's close that one that motorized look at that. a motorized cassette door have you ever seen one right so, let's take the customer's cassette out, put it somewhere safe so we don't damage that. Switch that speaker off. 
Um, I think we can, for now, disconnect the sound. Pop that to one side. And let's take the old cabinet apart and see what's inside. Inside here, right? So we can see we've got uh, two mechanisms on the inside of this, and um, one of which is going to be used on this side to um, drive the um, the turn uh, the tape deck mechanism and presumably the fast forward and rewind. Uh, but is one of these going to also be used to open and close the, the deck? Let's have a look at the operation of right. Right. pressing that doesn't do anything. Right. Turned on. So that's the open and close. Yeah. Okay. So on this one we can see, turn it around here, we can see when we do open and close, oh, something is engaging with the, the capstan. So that's the main, the main capstan is in there, which if we have a look with this camera and hopefully we don't get too much flicker, we can bring it down here to see what's going on and do a bit of focusing. So when we press open and close, See, there's a mechanism there that engages with a, like a lifter. So that opens and closes that mechanism. So the same motor that's used interesting, it doesn't turn the other way. Or is that just a just a little click? And this one, no such motor operation is occurring. Hmm. In this one, nothing is happening. Now, do we get an indicator? No, we don't. There's no indicator to say that we've actually press the button. I'm just assuming that the button is pressing. Ah. Now just looking down here I notice that ribbon cable there which is the main connection to the deck doesn't look like it's squarely in. I'm wondering if possibly what's happened is that the let's power it off and unplug it for a minute. If that ribbon cable is just doesn't feel secure. Could it be? That ruin cable is just not quite in its socket. Right, let's plug it back in. Oh, see, the deck is working, so it's got power. Just not 
activating with that thing now. Can we manually see is it the door jammed? The door seems to be fairly loose in its operation. So, the question remains, do we have a problem with the deck, or do we have a problem with the electronics? Well, given that we've got two identical mechanisms, and they seem, certainly seem to be identical in every way, I'm wondering whether it's worth taking the connection off and swapping it over and see if the connection, if the problem swaps. So if we plug that ribbon cable into this deck and vice versa, if the problem then swaps to this, we'll know that the problem is with the control. Uh, but if the problem stays with that, then we'll know the problem's with the deck. So it's a way of ice, half isolating what the problem is. So let's unplug that again for a while. And then we can let's unplug it from the back, make life a bit easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I think the best way of doing this is by removing the whole front panel assembly. Oh, a bit of that. Here we go. And on here there are three screws holding this front panel in. Same as the other two, so we don't need to worry about mixing them up. Decent sized screws. Now the deck mechanism can come away from the front. Like so. Okay, now for the sake of pulling wires out and causing things, what I'll do is on the main PCB there we've got the two um, head cables so go to the head so uh, we'll find my little puller with is just one main ribbon connector. Let's just temporarily take that off for a minute. Let's see if we can then swap this cassette 
ribbon cables across. We may not have enough stretch. Hmm. This could be more awkward than anticipated. Let's gently take that. Now just so that we don't get these confused. Uh, we call that deck one. So if we just write a number one on that little bit of like that and number two there. So it's deck number one which is the problem deck. Now is there going to be enough leeway? No. That's typical. That's not going to allow us to move that across there easily. And that deck is firmly screwed into there. I don't want to force the deck open. Well, that one reached there. No, it won't. close up specs on from it. But one thing it does allow us to see, however, is the mechanism at the back here. Now that is in fact the actual lifter release mechanism, so at least we know we can wind that manually out. We know that the ejection mechanism is clear and there is no nothing jamming that door up. Can we easily take that whole cassette deck out of there? Okay, well most of these mechanisms have got like a false door on the front. So the actual door is there. Um, so um, this bit on the front here is just the looky, nicey looky bit. And there seems to be a little catch there. And sure enough, that comes away. So let's put that somewhere safe. If we do the same with the other one, we can manually wind that mechanism. So therefore just protecting the customer's property just that little bit more. Deck two. So now if we wind those decks back in, manually, oh, I'm moving through, much easier than this one, this one feels like it's actually engaging more. And this one does. So that's not actually engaging with anything. I'm wondering if this is just all a mechanical one, mechanical problem. Anyway, we've now got the cassette decks back, so we should be able to remove the decks from the chassis. Here, we 
which hopefully you can see right across the bottom. Um, one, two, three, four, and then on the top side of the deck onto the plastic two on the top. So if we undo all six of those, the whole deck assembly should I didn't break anything then, that loud crack, it was just the screw being released from its years in place. Right, now hopefully the cassette mechanisms should come away. Yabba dabba doozy. Like so. Which will allow us to gain a bit more access as and when we need it. So what we can now do is now just temporarily shove that back. like so. Reconnect that ribbon cable. Reconnect that ribbon cable onto the main board and then this deck one ribbon cable we can now bring the whole deck across here and plug deck one ribbon cable into the bottom of a deck two. So being careful not to twist that too much, yeah. Okay. Push that gently into it. Now it should. Hopefully there's no logic that says, hang on a minute, we haven't got deck one connected, therefore don't work. So we should in theory, be able to say that deck one is this one and it will just work as it should do. So, power input, plug that into the bench, power on, so the power switch and that, all that is all working. And deck one opens. Yay. So, we now know that there's no problem with the logic and that ribbon cable is fine. So the problem has got to be just with deck one, not with the electronics. Good. Power it off. Now just out of pure interest, let's reverse the process and connect decks Two's electronics with deck one mechanism. Can we do that? Is there enough flexibility? Yes, just about. I'm going to have to balance things here. The bench space is a bit limited. Thankfully, that socket is easily get atable. Hold that mechanism like that. Power it on. Yeah, deck one operated. But open and close is not working. So the problem is with the deck one mechanism or electronics drive here. That's what you call progress of a sort. But now the fact that we've got deck one out, I think the next thing we can do is just temporarily remove deck one from this bar so we can take deck two away out of things. And then we're left with just purely deck one to work on. That 
appears to want to come away from there. So this should make life a lot easier. And again, top that mechanism over there out of the way. Keep it nice and safe. So we can concentrate purely on deck one and we can work on it relatively easily. So the first thing we want to have a little look at, quick look and see if there's any signs of any damage. Now from experience of other mechanisms and things that I've worked on. I can say fairly categorically that this beastie of a chip is the motor driver and that will if anything be a possible potential cause that's all it is is it basically power amps to drive the motors um, one way or the other and it could be that the logic is getting to that but the output isn't operating so we may have to find a manual for that. Now let's just have a look and see if there's any, I don't think there's any microcontroller chips or anything like that. But the other thing is that deck mechanisms, as we can see in here, need to know where they are. So there's going to be switches and if we look in here we can see one, um, to, and these are little switches which are operated when bits of the mechanism go through a certain position. And as you remember I said earlier on that I felt that this mechanism wasn't really feeling as though it was engaged. So it's a possibility that something in the mechanism is and you see that one when it gets to the end there it pushes that little switch. Let me just focus better on there. If I can. Come on, focus. Give me a mouse to sit on the focus lever on the software is. When we get to the end, you see that, that part of the mechanism there engages that little switch. Now it says, right, that deck is now open, turn the motor off. And Presumably, that other switch, which is in there, so we get, get in there. When the mechanism comes down, tells that other switch that it's down. I can see more clearly it is. So, let's get that in focus. Now, presumably, that solenoid is what ah, is used to engage the mechanism. solenoid is down. So the right position for that solenoid is down. So we may have inadvertently caused a problem with that. Hopefully not. That will probably be when it does a little reshuffle at startup. That will sort itself out. Right. Get me old test meter on continuity mode. So what we should be able to do oh, I change cameras is 
measure the continuity on the back of these switches. So there's one there and one there. So when the deck is down, as it appears to be, I think that switch there should be closed. And that one should be open. Oh, that one's closed as well. Interesting. And then when that mechanism opens up, that should become open circuit. It does. And so does that one. But there's nothing operating that one. Oh, perhaps they're in parallel. Yeah, that, that's not surprising. So that should now be closed again. And that one will be as well. Right. So, end stop switches. It's just a logic switch. I'm not controlling any... Um, power or anything like that, a tiny little leaf switches in there and all they're doing is saying right um, deck close, open the deck, they're both open, close and when they go down, deck close, they're both close and that one goes like that. So they're both in parallel. Okay, so that's one area of potential problem eliminated. We know that the power that comes in must be okay because everything is working okay, so that's where the power comes in, so we can forget about power into the board. Um, I think just for the temporary purposes of stopping that cable getting nudged, we'll just unplug that cable there and put that with the other one. That just gives us a little bit of leeway. So that's the head ribbon cable into there and then that connects across to that cable. There's a capacitor there, it looks okay. this back in. Switch your meter to DC volts. Chassis should be good enough for ground. Make a good ground connection on there. And then if we plug it in. Now this mechanism should do a little reset and I think we'll see that, that solenoid will drop. That's not going to open and close, no. So now let's just have a quick look and see if there's any voltages. Right, now I've got the other camera set up uh, with um, my meter there. So uh, what I'm going to do is have a little look at the uh, supplies into here. So if we've got any kind of supplies coming into here, we should see it on some of these pins. We've got 4.8 volts on there. Seven volts on there. 4.8 volts on there. So we've got voltages coming in, so we know our, our ground connection for the meter is working okay. Now, um, the rest of these will probably be some form of um, data lines. They may chop and change if we press the button.
ping votes on that. So, no logic changes that I can see. Hmm. I think we need to find a circuit diagram for it. Just going to go and see if I can find a circuit diagram. Well, at this particular point, I did manage to find a service manual online, um, and it uh, it was very useful. But it uh, it proved, if nothing else, that the fault was actually uh, a uh, mechanical fault, a fault with the deck uh, in the long term. So uh, rather than spend a long time following all this, that I. Um, uh, was working on this to identify where the fault was electronically. Uh, if you want to skip on to where I actually found the fault, which was uh, actually a fault with the deck mechanism, it was an electrical fault, but a fault uh, with the deck mechanism, then please do feel free to jump ahead uh, and you will find a chapter mark on the video and I'll also put a, a little card mark on there as well uh, to show you uh, where it is. So you can jump past all of this uh, electronic fault finding, but I'll leave it in for interest sake. And, uh, pin 1 which is usually indicated by the little uh, indent in the corner of the chip and we can see it just there, it's like a little circle. So if we turn the meter back on and we turn on the meter as well So we should be able to see, in fact actually if we put that down there, then we should be able to see what we're reading uh, each pin. So pin 1, we're reading 1.25, let's see uh, what should we be reading on there, pin 1, 0 0.25, well that's near enough. And two nine volt uh, nine millivolts. So and two should be ground. Ah. Wonder if because we are uh, that's just um interesting, turn that off for a second. Got a bad ground connection. That would tend to show it up, wouldn't it? So pin two. Definitely ground. And pin two is definitely ground. I think we've just got a spurious meter reading there because of the distance involved. Maybe we can put a meter on a better ground somewhere.
things that look like ground are not always ground. We've got a bit of a Stick with I'm going to stick with being on the chassis there. Right. That's going to be my ground. So we can power it back on. Pin one going on. Pin one. millivolts point two point two five millivolts is near enough and zero and three this is going there that is zero isn't it so we've just got a little bit of pick up through the voltage it's been three In 500 millivolts, what should we have? Nothing on there. What? We should have 5 volts on pin 19. So let's just go there. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
How many pins are there? Fourteen twenty-eight. So twenty pin twenty-eight zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, share fourteen volts from pin twenty eight. Should be fourteen volts there. And there's sixteen, which is okay, near enough. And then the next one down should have four point seven, which is near enough. That's pin 22. And we've got three ground pins and then 4.9 and 19. Which is that pin there. Yep. Zero on everything else. Near enough. Near enough. Fourteen's nothing. Four point nine and thirteen. Twelve eleven. Thirteen volts. Yep. The volts are a little bit on the high side, but I've often found that uh, so do we get any change on pins 15 and 16? When we press the button. Definitely changes something there. Let's turn it off, let's try that again. And press the eject, nothing. And the other one, nothing. Now the fact that we were getting a change on pins, uh, pin 15, would tend to indicate that um, it's getting a command uh, because we were just powering it off and powering it back on. What we're not getting is a command when we press the eject. And the reason I think, for, for me personally, is the fact that it doesn't know that that deck is ejected or not. So if we move over the circuit here, we can see that we've got some photo interrupters here and the um, um, the mode switches, yeah, which all feed back in here on these button on these lines A B C D E uh, there, and they will come back through down to here C D E back to the microcontroller, which is on another part of the circuit. And there's the open and close detect button uh, switches um, that uh, I mentioned earlier. Those two there. So it's possible that these photocouplers are not feeding back the right um, status uh, to the um, mechanism, to the uh, microprocessor, to say that the deck is open or closed. Although, really and truly, those are the ones that should be telling it. Now they feed into a little resistor block here. Um, so pin 6 of that resistor block should tell us, but really and truly we should be able to actually see on those switches, if you remember we had those switches and we just determined they were in, in parallel. Um, as you can see they are. So if we go on to those switches and see what voltage we've got there we've got 4.6 pressing the button not going to do a lot of good we we'll just turn it off for a minute now if we 
manually crank this mechanism up, do we see a big change in Like a minute, 4.7 volts. And then that drops down. So when the switch is open, we go up to 4.7, and when it's closed it drops down. So really and truly, it should know by these switches here that the door is either open or closed. Now these others A, B, G and F they go along here A, B, G and F to these switches here which are metal that's the, that's the switches on the top of the mechanism that determine the tape type now where are these optocouplers and what are they doing so they're the ones that determine whether the deck turns or not effectively giving the tape counter I think they probably are and we might be barking at the wrong tree there as well hmm. I have to give this some thought Okay, I just had a little thought, and when I was saying when I was uh, saying earlier on uh, that uh, we've got um, the mechanism of take one uh, working and the other one's not, but when we put when we switch it on. Um, it does a little shuffle and I just thought why is it doing a shuffle I put the original uh, put take uh, deck 2 in this position and it doesn't do a shuffle and I thought why is it doing a shuffle and then I looked at the mechanism and where it is sat and it's actually in play mode the pinch roll is engaged and if I power it off power it back on it can't eject because as far as it's concerned it's playing a tape so somewhere down the line it thinks it's in play mode. That reset is not resetting it. So the motor driver circuit is working okay. What's not happening is it's not being told that it's not in play mode. So um, somewhere in here then in this circuitry we have got something that tells it what mode of what position it's in whether it's in play or not and looking along here we've got these sensor tapes which say so, uh, these sensor switches which tell it what mode but i'm pretty sure that it's these optocouplers here that i've mentioned before are what's determining which direction it's in whether it's in play or not because there doesn't seem to be any other um, option that says uh, any any other uh, circuitry and even if we scroll up here this is uh, take uh, deck one sensor this is the this is the actual circuit <laughs> I've been looking down the wrong circuit that's deck two this is the circuit I should have been looking at but um, it's the same virtually the same identical circuitry so it doesn't really matter um, but this I'm pretty sure is what's telling it 
that it's in play or not play um, and therefore consequently this might be the, the reason for it so I think what I'm going to do um, I'm going to strip this mechanism down and have a look at the mechanism uh, and that shows us uh, or determines what position the deck is actually in um, and it could well be simply that there is uh, something that's not telling it that in the mechanism that it's not in the right position that it's actually in play and it should do a little shuffle and then unload and then once it's unloaded the cassette uh, door should be able to be opened electronically so uh, let's see if we can take this deck down to a mechanical position where we can find out what's why it thinks it should be in play mode uh, when it shouldn't be and odd little thing looking at that bit of the mechanism you see it's there just suddenly notice that mechanism there is sort of like bent let's compare it with deck 2 deck 2 is definitely in a different position and I'm wondering whether this is the reason for it. Is that mechanism there jammed in that position whereas that one's nice and loose? Could we be just simply got a jammed bit of mechanism which is pushing something in the wrong place? Yeah, in fact, actually, there's a switch there that's closed because that mechanism is pushed up. Is this one the same? No, that switch is open. Now. Ah, but don't forget, we are in play mode, aren't we? So perhaps that's normal for play mode position. So how do we get it out of play mode into non-play mode it might be you know, that might be a bit of an old red herring that when it's not in play mode that's that lever is down methinks we're going to have to think multiple times about this Think about the disassembly part of all of this to get at what we want to get at. That seems that's the gearing mode. Which should govern play or no play. Pretty sure. Let's put that back in there and see what happens when we power it. Let's just press stop. comes in and out of play mode, that lever there does not move. Let's crank it out of eject, out of uh, cassette open. Still, that lever is up there. Now, if we can, can 
temporarily open that switch. Yeah. There is your treble. So this switch here being permanently closed. Now I've released it. This is just a simple me a mechanical situation. See if it does a full reset. That's the reason for it. That little switch there is staying closed all the time it shouldn't do. And I suspect it's just literally got pushed into position, jammed there and stuck there. Because this one, this mechanism, we can see it's permanently open. And this one is permanently closed, so we've literally got a bent leaf spring, leaf switch. Unplug it. A pair of fine pliers. Let's get the mechanism open. you Adam and Eve it. That's, that leaf spring is just literally bent just a bit too much. Can we get in there and unbend it? If we put something underneath it Bend this end down. That's well clear now. A mechanical mistolerance. What can we put that down to? Possibly a number of things. Closes. There's no cassette in, so it won't do anything. Door open. Power on. Door open. Door closed. Door open. And close. And we're in playback mode. Auto reverse. Play in the opposite direction. Stop. Eject. Problem solved. A little tiny leaf switch was just bent, making contact that it shouldn't do. And that's switch S. 971. Let's have a look at that on the circuit diagram. So make 
sure we're on deck one. S971 is there. That's the mode switch. So that switch there was jammed. So and that was telling down this line, the E line here, and the A line, those two, which fed back to A and E in this circuitry, back down here, uh, C, there's E there, there's A go, A goes in there, and comes up to here, to this resistor pack, um, yeah, so it's using a combination of these switches here, open and closed, with that resistor on line A, through that switch there to there down to ground. So the combination of resistance of all of those feeding back onto the E line here is telling the processor that the door uh, that the mechanism is clo is in play mode and therefore can't eject. It's a fairly simple logic, but it's knowing that logic it's not something that's actually in the manual. I had a quick look through in case there was like a flow chart of operations and couldn't find one. Um, so, we found it. My guess is that something got jammed in there, something got taken out, maybe, or just literally it was left in one position for so long, I don't know. The two metal bars there and there look the same. This is B deck. It's quite loose. It's quite stiff. Everything else looks okay. That end looks okay. So, just literally that switch there, that mode switch there, I just literally somehow got bent up, I was making connection all the time. Right, so the next thing we'll do is just give the mechanism a little bit of a clean up, clean the heads, clean the uh, pinch roller and the capstans, um, just to make sure that it's all nice and clean, ready to go back. The belts all seem to be okay on both mechanisms. There doesn't seem to be any looseness in that, but certainly the easiest way to do this cleaning is with it all apart. We can see there's a little bit of a, uh, not necessarily contamination, but something that was worth giving a little clean with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. <laughs> Right, so reassembling, deck one is there, so let's put deck one there and deck two there, and we have the metal bar, Snugly. Meter 
しょうにもSo let's put a test tone in there. That's one kilohertz test tone. how stable it is. I haven't got a wow and flutter meter but uh, I have got a little oscilloscope uh, which I can attach to the audio output. Let's see. 970 hertz. Nice sound, uh, nice sine wave. Uh, as near as we're going to get to a kilohertz. I'm not going to adjust speeds on these decks. 980 hertz. As far as I'm concerned, that's, that's as close to a kilohertz as I can get. I'm not 100% sure of the accuracy of that, but I know that test tone what I was looking for more was constant so let's reset the counter and we'll know on that one so we're now playing back on deck one recording on deck two nice constant level between the two Reset the counter. Let's try two times on the single side. So, let's 
actual output levels from that tape one are slightly higher. So this is a copy of a tape, test tape on another machine. So as long as we get the, oh there we go, we've got the same levels there. Look. 253. Right, so let's just rewind that a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Sounds like it's auto dubbing. Sounds good to me. I think we can say that's a successful repair. Job done. Put that camera over there. Let's go back to there and uh, say there we are. So thanks very much for watching this one. I'll put it all back together, but you don't really need to see me do that. But I'll do that and then I'll do it in high speed and whiz to the end. But uh, thanks very much for watching. It's another successful repair. Albeit not really an electronic one, more of a, a mechanical one. Uh, but hopefully the disassembly and the logical fault finding has helped. Uh, and if it helps you, then great. Um, nice to speak to you. Uh, see you again soon.